Stephanie Moore. I am the missions director here at Second Chance Church, and this is my story. In childhood, I was raised in the church. My dad would arrange for us to go to church. He would have several people pick us up. You know, we had a lady that picked us up. My mom would take us. We had different designated people that got my brother and I to church. Um, my dad never really went. We convinced him as teenagers one time to go to church and he promised he would never go back. It was just not for him. He was a believer, but he did not go to church and stay in a church group setting. So after childhood growing up into teenage years, I hit or miss would go to church, you know. My brother and I found a church through one of my dad's friends that we would drive ourselves to. Um, and then the older I got, it got a little bit spotty going to church. I kind of stopped going. I would hit or miss, maybe go, maybe not. Ended up getting married, started a family. We were not involved in a church at that time. Um, my mom kept my girls when they were little. Um, from the time my youngest was born, she kept them all the way up until my oldest started kindergarten. Um, she made sure to take them to church. Her and my stepdad took both of my kids. They went to church. There was not a day that they weren't somehow involved in the church, whether that be they were going to meetings, they were going to different ch church groups with my mom. Um, they were in a Catholic church, so they went to mass regularly. There was always a, some sense of my kids being brought up in the church. It was not me taking them at that point or my husband but we knew that they were still getting filled. Later on, through all of that, my dad was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And it was shortly after we lost my grandpa, who died from the same thing. And I prepared for him to die. I mean, I thought I was prepared to lose him. I was his primary caregiver. Um, we fought for several years with him having cancer and the longer it lasted, we went through chemo, we went through radiation, went through remission, then it came back. The longer we went through it, the more I thought I was mentally and emotionally prepared to lose him. We had funeral services, we had everything down to the wire planned for him to go. He he was the one that raised me when he and my mom divorced we stayed with my dad my mom knew that my dad could give us a better life than she could he could provide for us so we stayed with my dad you know and so he became my rock that was hearing the diagnosis of him having cancer and even trying to imagine not having him totally threw me in a whirlwind but with that being said, I still stayed focused on getting him well, getting him better. And I just knew that the day would come that he, we would lose him. You know, he would, he would be gone. But I didn't think what that would do to me. I thought we have all of this stuff prepared, we're ready, final wishes. One thing my dad, um, one of his, my dad was in the used car business, he was a car dealer, and one of his friends from the car business is actually a pastor at a church in Plainfield, and he pulled him aside one day and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to die, and I know I'm going to die, but I want to be baptized. I don't want anybody else there, I just want you to take me, and I want to be baptized. I want to know for sure that I'm going home. So my dad's friend took him got him baptized. That was really the most I think we ever heard my dad talk about God, talk about church, was he wanted to ensure that he knew where he was going. So the time comes after years of battling cancer, three years we went through this, and we lost, we lost him. And he died July 20th of 2015. Um, just a couple weeks before my oldest was going to start first grade. So I, in that time, went through, you can't imagine the emotion. It's not, it's something that I couldn't imagine. I thought I was prepared, but what I wasn't prepared for, I prepared for him to die, but I didn't prepare 
how I was going to live the rest of my life. How was I going to live without him? How was I going to focus? How was I going to get up? Those are things I didn't think about. But the time came, and it came very quickly. And I found myself in a deep, dark tunnel is the only way of explaining it. I still had two small kids at home, still had a husband, still had a life, still had a job, work night shift. And I found myself just having no reason to get up in the morning. I ended up going to the doctor, crying my eyes out. I don't feel right. You know, I'm an emotional mess. I don't know how people do this. I don't know how I'm supposed to continue. I hit a depression that I would not wish on anybody. I didn't know what else to do. So I started taking antidepressants. Didn't really make me feel better. It made me feel foggy, trying to get the certain dosage adjusted. I just didn't feel my normal, but I wasn't. I had a hole that could never be filled again. So the days continue on. We're walking, you know, every morning. Myself, my husband Jason, and our youngest Kylie would walk my oldest daughter Natalie to school. She was in first grade at this point. And we live across the street, so we just walk to the end of our road, use the crosswalk, walk over, and drop her off at school. Well, that started August 4th would have been my dad's 59th birthday, and that was the first day of school. We walked Natalie to school. At the end of the road, there was a resource officer, which was somewhat new to Plainfield at that time for us to have a designated officer at the school. And we, you know, every day we kind of smiled, exchanged waves, moved on, but we noticed our youngest daughter was really connecting and she would reach out. She was very quiet, very shy. She has learned to come out of her shell more so than when she was little, but she didn't talk to really anybody outside of family. So to watch this bond that she had with this resource officer at the end of the road was kind of cool to watch. It was a connection that we had never seen her make with a stranger before. The stranger turned into a friend, turned into somebody that she enjoyed seeing, somebody she looked forward to seeing every day. So they created a friendship, and it was one that we just thought, this is the coolest thing ever. As time goes on, that stranger is Josh Cook. He became a friend of our family. We all talked every day as we went, you know, dropped Natalie off at school. We would say, you know, how are you? Have a little conversation. And then we would go home. As the time went on, those conversations, you know, we became closer. And one day he said, hey, you know what? Our church is having a Christmas service at Plainfield Middle School. Why don't you guys come? You know, we would love to have you there. We were like, okay, you know, we'll think about it. So we walked home. And there was not really a lot of discussion other than what should we wear, what time should we be there. It was an immediate, we knew that we were going to go. We didn't have a home church. We hadn't ever went to church as a family, the four of us. So we talked to the kids. There was no question. They were on board. Kylie was so excited. Josh told her that he was going to be singing. He was the worship leader. She was sold. There was, we could not have not taken her. That's how excited she was. So we went to the middle school, sat through the Christmas service, it was incredible. As soon as we walked in, it felt like you, we were in a school, but it felt like we were at church. I mean, it, the church feeling was there, it felt, it felt right. It was a feeling that I hadn't felt in a long time. So for the next few months, I would say probably three or four months, we watched every Sunday. We streamed online. We would have church service in our living room. At that time, the church was in Castleton, so we didn't necessarily want to drive every Sunday all the way up north. So we would just watch online. One morning we got up and we said, you know what, let's try this. Let's go, let's make the trip, see what it's about, see what the actual church is like. So we got ready, got in the car. You know, every Sunday, Kylie would text Josh and say, you know, hi, or, you know, good service. She'd always tell him, you know, play my song. She has a favorite song that she wanted to sing. That morning, we did something different. We sent a picture and said, ready for church, of just Kylie. And he said, great, enjoy, have fun. He didn't realize that we were in the car on our way to Castleton to see, to come to church, to see what it was really about. 
So we got there and I remember pulling up and there was a big sign out front that said, turn on your flashers if you're a first time guest. And I looked over my shoulder and made contact with Jason and said, if you think about turning those flashers on, I will not get out of this car. Just act like we've been here before. Don't make a scene. Just look straight ahead. I'm not really the outgoing people person that likes to go into strange places where I don't know anybody. So he didn't turn, he, he spared his life. He did not turn on the flashers and we walked in and I remember Dave Alderson was the first person that we ran into. First thing he wanted to know is what sports team do you cheer for? And that started a conversation with he and Jason. Kylie ran straight to Josh. They had their little moment, you know, everybody was excited, we were there. We really just felt like that was a missing piece to what we needed. So I don't think we ever stopped going from that Sunday. We continued. I mean, that was our, that was our new normal. For me, myself, for my story, I had that feeling that I hadn't had in a long time. It didn't replace my dad being there, but it gave me that feeling that I do still have love to receive. There are people that can love me, that can love my family, that can give me joy for what I'm looking for. And Josh ended up asking at one point in time, you know, what day did your dad die? And I said, he, July 20th, right before school started. School started, I, I think the school started on August 5th that year. And Josh said on August 4th, he received a phone call that said the school that he was assigned to was Clark's Creek. Um, which, where his son was starting kindergarten, that became, they, they gave that to another officer and they were going to move him to Central, which is where my girls were. And I really feel like at that point, it was kind of God intervening, saying, you know, I'm going to place this family here. I'm going to place this opportunity for you to get into a church right dead square in the middle of your path where you can't avoid it. And just that one simple asking, you know, hey, you guys want to come to church? You know, we're having a service. That was, I felt like it was a coincidence, but the more that I'm in church and I realize like, you know, these are God moments, this was a God thing. For our youngest daughter to not talk to anybody, form a relationship with somebody, then to get invited into church and to become a regular, to become a member, to become we are involved in this church so deep. <laughs> Every ounce of everything that happens, it feels like we are involved somehow. That's how much it has really changed my life and our family's life. We can't imagine not going. Through that, we've created a family. I've created people that I trust, where I had blocked everybody out. I don't feel the sadness anymore that I felt before. I feel like, you know, God took part of my family, but then he gave me a new family to help mourn with me. I mean, and that's what it was. Nobody here knew my dad, but it it's almost as if I have a new family to mourn with, to understand, to listen, to talk to me, you know, kind of help me out. I had a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, and I remember somebody told me that grace is for everyone. The Cook family was placed in front of us in our path to get us to where we are, to get our family into church. It feels like that was a God thing for us. That was God stepping in and saying, you know, I'm going to give you family to mourn with. I've taken family, but I'm going to give you family to mourn with. I'm going to give you a family, a new family to grow with. I'm going to patch I will never say that my heart has mended from losing my dad. Um, I will say that it does feel like there's a patch over it. It does feel warmer. I do have the ability to love and to have compassion again where I, didn't, I don't feel like I'm in that dark tunnel anymore. And it feels like God prepared to mend my heart before it was ever even broken. And all of that happened with one simple invitation, one simple, hey, come join us. It'll be fun, be a great time. Relationships happen, friendships developed. You know, our family and the Cook family 
you know, we're very grateful. I'm very grateful that we had that, you know, that invitation that they reached out and then our families became so close and through that we have created such relationships with people in the church here at Second Chance Church. You know, we, that is, our life kind of revolves around Second Chance Church. Everything we do is with the intentions of, you know, is it, what can we do? Do we have something at church Sunday? Do we have this? Everything we do is through, you know, the love of the friends that we've made here. So I, I'm very grateful for that invitation. I'm very grateful for having a mother that has taught me about the Bible. My mom is very intentional with teaching verses from the Bible. Anything that happens in my life, it seems like my mom has a verse. She tells me exactly where to go to look for it in the Bible. And I sometimes have no idea where that comes from, but she just knows. And after losing my dad, my mom and I growing up, I was not the closest with my mom. But after losing my dad, made me realize I have a parent. I still have a parent. And I have one that I haven't really had that connection with. I've distanced myself from my mom in my teenage years and my childhood years. And as I became a mom, I realized I really needed a mom. I needed my mom. And after losing dad, I got that relationship with my mom that I never had. So she preached the, the Bible to me. I mean, she really gave me hope. So I felt like losing my dad made my mom and I's relationship much more meaningful. I became much closer to my mom. And this is a chapter in my book, my story of my life. And I am grateful for the invitation. I'm grateful for the people that have reached out to me. I'm grateful to be able to sit here and tell you that I no longer feel like I fight depression like I did before. I mean, there's days, of course, that I get sad, but I have so much good in my life and so much happiness that it's easier to focus on that than to focus on what I've lost. Every day is not like I don't think about my dad. My dad is, I am living proof that my dad was quite a character. I've inherited every, <laughs> every quality he had in his life, I've inherited from him. It's from his sense of humor, his anger, his jokes, his ability to love, his ability to want to serve and to help others and to find the people that truly needed help. And he would just pour that out into them. He always took care of people, always made sure that he provided anything they needed, whether it be a meal, whether it be a shower, a place to sleep. So I feel like missions is a place for me to be. And it's not that I think I can do better in the world, in the community. It's just, that's what I know. That's my normal. That's how I was raised. It was a normal part of my life to see my dad helping others. So all of the ties just come back together and it all makes perfect sense. You know, I wasn't invited to church just because, hey, we want you to come, come hang out. You're another number, another body, another paycheck. It really was intentional. I feel like we were invited because God knew that I needed a nudge and it needed to be something that wasn't, hey, this is it. I need you. You have to come here. This is the end of the road for you if you don't get in church. I needed somebody just to be able to tell me, you know, we want you to come. We we're excited for you to come and to watch the relationships that my kids have formed and it's amazing it's we could not imagine ourselves anywhere else but second chance church you know this this is home for us our kids feel at home and my husband feel at home this i mean this is it it took a lot to get me here and something i never want to relive a tragedy i never want to think about but it's always right there. It took a tragedy to bring a whole family closer to Christ. And ultimately, that's what we needed. And we're very grateful for that. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, I know your dad, but I know you. And it seems like your dad was a very remarkable man. And, uh, uh, we, we're so thankful to have you a part of our church, and 
Um, so yeah, um, my name is Pastor Chad. I'm one of the staff pastors here at Second Chance Church, and it's awesome to be on a microphone this morning um, because first service, I wasn't. Um, we had a little technical difficulty, so thank you guys in the back. Um, you're awesome. You rock. Um, but we are wrapping up our series of storytellers, and, and really this is a season uh, of storytellers because uh, the truth is uh, we're going to have this series again. We, we believe, and you've heard me say this, that, that God does some amazing things through our stories, um, allowing us to, to share what God's done in our, in our lives and what He continues to do. And uh, I'm so thankful for Bruno and Christina and Tammy and, and Stephanie, and um, it's just been an awesome, awesome season of storytellers. And if you have uh, a story that God's put on your heart, uh, uh, please, we'll be having this series again in the spring. Um, by all means, uh, we know that through your stories, God does uh, amazing things. And um, as I think about, I, I think I've heard Stephanie's story four or five times now um, this week. And, and as I sit in here in our makeshift studio uh, over here in what we call Phil's office, um, I had this whole different title um, that I even sent Stephanie, that I had this title um, for her her story, and, and it just it went a total different direction when I started hearing her story. And and uh, what I what I try to do is have our, our people write out their stories, uh, but to hear the story, um, it took me in a, a different direction. And, and I really want to I titled this uh, message uh, "Blessed Roadblocks." And so it takes me to our, our, our uh, passage today. So if you'd stand with me, we're going to be in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. Um, Acts chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 26 through 39. Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 26 through 39. That's right after the book of John and right before uh, the book of Romans. So Acts chapter 8 starting in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch and an important official in charge of the, tr of the treasury of Gondake. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip, Philip said, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And, and, he, and the passage uh, the scripture, the eunuch was written, it's actually from Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verses 7 and 8. It says, says, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before a shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch, the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came up to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Lord, I'm so thankful of the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. I'm so thankful for stories like uh, like Stephanie's, God, where, where we see this, as she said, this God thing, but we, we, we know that it's, it's your divine intervention. It's your blessed roadblocks, God. It's, it's you being intentional 
about putting people in our path to show how much you love us. And so God, today I pray, uh, Lord, that our hearts and our minds can be open uh, to your word and be open to, to the lesson uh, of your love and, 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 the, and the intentionality, God, that you continue to bless us and love us and walk with us. And God, we give you all the give you all the honor, God, and thank you so much for what you've done. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. You know, one of the things that I absolutely love about our God is the truth that he orchestrates time and time again um, these God moments. Um, these these times where we're, we're on this journey, we're on the, this path, and, and, and we're not maybe looking for God, and, and we're, we're kind of focused on something else, but, but we, we, we have these God moments, these divine interventions where God intentionally puts someone or, or a group of people in our path. When, when I think about uh, the eunuch and I think about the, the scripture from Acts, um, how this man came to worship, but he didn't quite understand what was going on. He didn't quite understand who Isaiah was talking about. And we have this, um, uh, we have this, um, this blessing, this honor to, to kind of know the history, and we, can, we got the, the honor to be able to read God's Word and understand that Isaiah is talking about uh, Jesus, and, and, and Isaiah is a, a great prophet who uh, prophesied about the birth of Jesus and, and the death of Jesus, and, and so on this path, and this, this eunuch is trying to understand who the prophet's talking about, and, and God sends Philip at the right place and at the right time. And see, I just find it amazing that, that, that God loved this Ethiopian so much that he intentionally sent Philip in the direct line of his path. And, 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 and I, want, I want to point something out here that, that we kind of look at something a little more a step further. You see, you and I can think about our life and, and where God has put people in our path and, and in our journey. But see, those people that have been put in our path also have to be obedient to that call. And you see, Philip had to say, yes, Lord, yes, Holy Spirit, yes, God, I will be obedient to traveling down this path to, to meet this Ethiopian, he has to be a sense of, of, of intentionality on his part. There has to be obedience for the person that's going to be used. And see, as, as we go down this, this, this path, we see that because Philip was obedient, because God loved the Ethiopian, the eunuch, that there was this divine intervention. And, and knowing Stephanie like I do, and knowing Jason and Natalie and Kylie, to see where they were when they, and I remember that Christmas service. It was actually the first time that I've ever preached at Second Chance Church was, was at the middle school. And I remember that night. It, it was an amazing night. And it's neat to sit back and think that, you know, God had a plan to, to move Second Chance Church here to Plainfield. And He had this path for us. And, and to know that was Jason and Stephanie's first, uh, uh, you know, uh, mission, his fir their first time ever coming to SEC, I just, I'm just kind of blown away. And, and seeing them and knowing them and knowing that, that, that God sent this, uh, this uncommon person, this, um, and we all know Josh, we all love Josh, uh, but, but God just placed Josh directly in their path. And, and let, me just, let me just be transparent here. I have tried to be friends with Kylie, and she rejects me. Over and over. I'm not bitter 
at all. I think she's just giving me a hard time. Right, Jason? Yeah? yeah. But to have this connection is something I, I find fascinating. And, and, and moms have this, this, uh, this extra sense about them. And, and, and so hear me out. I'm not trying to bash dads. I happen to be one. I'm not trying to put down dads, but mom have they, they have this way, moms have this way of just um, noticing some of the other things that sometimes us fathers don't see. And see, when, when a mom sees that someone is being kind to their child, or there's been this connection, or or or, or she sees that there's uh, there's this person that's that's made this connection like Josh did with Kylie and 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 as Stephanie said you know Kylie's kind of shy and she's kind of reserved and and to have Josh just make that connection I can only imagine that for Jason and Stephanie it just kind of melted their hearts and and they could see the innocence in that and the and the purity in that and I, and I believe that God has a plan, and he had a plan for the Moors. But it had to, to start somewhere. It had to start on a, on a walking path from their house to Central Elementary. It had to start with a connection of a, just a sweet little girl and this police officer who has just this big heart to love on people. And, and getting to know the Moore family like I do now, it, it's amazing to see that this, that divine intervention, that, that intentionality that God loves them so much and He has a plan for them, it, it simply is amazing. Stephanie heads up our, our uh, missions here at SEC and she's made uh, this connection with Family Promise, that's the um, that's the homeless organization here in Henderson County where, where we've just been able to serve. We've, we've went over there, and it's our old building on Vine Street. We've went over there and provided dinner. We've, we, uh, in October, thank you guys. You're awesome. Hope you read my email. We, we were able to uh, collect over 400 pairs of socks uh, for that ministry. We, uh, we're collecting coats that are eventually going to go to that ministry. We're, we have a lot of things, and Stephanie has developed this relationship because she has a heart to serve. And she has a heart for Jesus, and she has a heart just to help people. And, and, and Jason, who on Thursday I discovered that we're even closer than brothers because we both have a love for boys to men, didn't know that. And it was like this, it was like, I was talking about, I went to the Boys to Men concert, State Fairgrounds, and Jason said, oh, that's great. And then Jason, we're, eyes just connected, and we're like, did we just become best friends? It was, it was magical. But, but if you know Jason, and, and, and Pastor Dave said it perfectly Thursday night at, a, at house party. Pastor Dave said, Jason has a heart that's bigger than his body. He has a heart to, to serve. And if you ask uh, Jason more that I need help with this, uh, Jason will just jump at the moment and go help. And one of the things uh, that I learned about Jason when we went down to Texas to, to help rebuild after Hurricane Harvey, I just see that Jason just, just wants to help and, and he has desire to, when people are down, he'll give anything to help those people out. You see, God's saved their family. God sent people, and not just Josh. I mean, I, I know he sent Pastor Dave. Hopefully when they walked in, the first thing Jason said, I'm a Cubs fan, because they would have just been immediate connection. But I know he sent several people in this church as divine intervention. And see, what's cool about Stephanie's story is that God not only had a plan to change those Moore's family's life, 
but now he's using them to impact others. You see, our God sees a big picture. Our God knows what he's doing. Our God uses the most unlikely people at the most unlikely time to impact our life. These blessed roadblocks, these divine interventions. And I would imagine that every one of you across this room and joining us online can think back to a time that someone loved me enough. My God loved me someone and loved me enough to send someone into my life that introduced me to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that our God loved you enough. He chose the right person at the right time. And I also would imagine that you're sitting here and some of you have been the Philip. Some of you have been the Josh Cooks or, or the Dave Aldersons. Because God is going to use us. That's why I love storytellers. I love this series because this is telling our stories and, it, and it's going to resonate with someone here that says, wow, that's kind of like my story. Wow, I didn't realize that this person went through this terrible time. Wow, I, I, I can identify having a, a deep, dark depression. Wow, I can identify in, in, in other people's story where they've, they've been a, a victim of abuse or neglect. I can identify with that person. And then I start to realize, you know what? I'm not alone. When, when we walk through those doors... We realize that this is an imperfect church with imperfect people that are still trying to figure out life. And so when we have the Stephanies and the Christinas and the Tammies and the Brunos and, and the others that have shared their stories, we start to realize that our God truly loves us. And, and as the band comes forward, when we begin to close, I want, I can, I'm hoping you can grasp His love. Back to our scripture today. Ethiopia is a country that's surrounded around other Muslim nations. Ethiopia is a country where it, it's predominantly also Muslim. And let me tell you, you're, if you're in a Muslim country, it's not like the U.S. where you can choose to worship and you can choose where you want to go to church and you can refuse to not go to church. And the Muslim, you, you don't go away from the Muslim religion. And I'm not going to get into it too in depth. But here's the fascinating part of what's going on in that country today. It is one of the fastest growing Christian nations in the world. And I believe it started on that desert road with Philip and the eunuch. You see, our God not only wanted the eunuch to find and discover and have a relationship with Christ. But God saw the bigger picture. He saw a nation that desperately needed him. And if that doesn't blow your mind, if that doesn't melt your heart, I don't know what will. So as you guys would stand with me this morning. You'd bow your heads and close your eyes. I just have a couple questions for you this morning. Who has God sent in your life? Who has God intentionally put in your life? 
your path, your journey. That God made the change agent in your life. And another question. Who is God calling you to be the Philip or the Pastor Dave or the Josh in someone else's life? And I was down here during worship and I looked over to our prayer board and the, and the hundreds of names that are up here on this prayer board. Is God calling you to be the Philip in their life? And are you open and are you going to be obedient? And finally, what's your story? What's your God story? And in that story, are you brave enough? Do you have enough courage to invite someone to Second Chance Church? Do you have the courage to share with someone, share your story with someone? and share about the love of Jesus Christ. So as we go to prayer, and the music plays softly, I just want to take a moment to just bask in the glory of God. And I want to open up the altars this morning. Maybe you need to come and pray for someone. Maybe that God's calling you to be the Philip. Maybe... Uh, maybe God is, is calling you to be the Josh Cook or the Pastor Dave or those people that He's placed in our lives. Or, or, or maybe you want to come up here and just praise God that He loved you so much that He put a blessed roadblock in your path. And you now have this relationship with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank You. Lord, thank You. That God, You are the God that, that sees the big picture. God, that You will do the smallest things as we say no details too small to show us how much You love us. And God, I'm thankful when we go through those difficult times, Lord, when we, we have those holes in our hearts, God, when we're battling, when we're, when we're just all alone, God, I'm so thankful that you're right there with us. And so, God, this morning, I, I pray as a church, Lord, I, I just hope and pray, Lord, that, that we can take time this morning to thank you for the blessed roadblocks, the, the divine interventions, God. And I also pray, God, that we can be obedient when you call us to be those roadblocks. God, thank you. I want to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, Pastor Chad here. Thank you so much for viewing one of our previous messages on our YouTube channel. We're praying and hoping that God speaks to you in such a unique and powerful way that your hearts and your minds are open uh, to what He has to tell you. If you want to support the mission of Second Chance Church, please go to our website at secondcc.com. Thank you and God bless.